Um, thank you very much for uh, having me. And um, you know, I'm a, a faculty member. I was a faculty member for 20 years. So uh, please don't just sit there and, and uh, don't ask questions. Just jump in as, as things come along. So. Means there will be no quiz at the end. There is a quiz at the end, particularly for the people sitting up the back, Steve Pearson. <laughs> so the D Student <laughs> Union. There is something, another thing I'm obliged to say. Uh, Notice we are recording this session. We did have a lot of interest from folks who couldn't be here, who hoped that some type of recorded version of this would be made available later on the web. Uh, so we um, are recording and hope to, to do that, provide them possibly with copies of the presentation slides themselves. Uh, so I just want you to know that this is recorded. Uh, don't say anything too embarrassing. But Were you making a comment about my <laughs> <laughs> All I'll say is I hopped up as soon as you finished talking. <laughs> <laughs> but but well, again, that's kind of the, the lay of the land here. <laughs> OK, so I have a lot of slides, uh, probably too many. Uh, but what I um, am going to do is I'm going to give you some motivation uh, I'm particularly going to focus on the DOD questions that uh, Jim posed. Um, you know, what's the basis for DOD uh, S&T uh, decisions? Uh, are they faith-based or are they empirically based? And what can we learn from what's been done in the non-R&D, non-DOD R&D uh, sphere? And so I'm going to try and talk about that in, in some detail. So those are the same questions that have been posed by Jack Marburger, the former science advisor to uh, President Bush, uh, Colin McElwain, uh, who writes for Nature, who pointed out that um, spending on science is one of the best ways to generate jobs and economic growth, say research advocates, but the evidence behind those claims is patchy. Uh, and it's also been uh, asked for us from the taxpayer. What are we getting out of? Uh, Federal Investments in General, that's the recovery.gov website. This isn't a new question. This is a picture of Neil Lane, who was science advisor to um, uh, President Clinton. And th there's a picture from one of Neil's slides where he says, uh, uh, Clinton is saying, how much do you want us to spend on nanotech? And uh, we don't have, I'm here to tell you that, uh, and I'll, I'll spell this out in a little bit more detail, is that we don't have a very strong uh, scientific basis for this. Uh, this is what Jack Marger, Marburger pointed out. I mean, contemplating one's navel and coming up with a number like, oh, seems like 3% on R&D uh, doesn't seem like a very scientific basis for the science policy. In fact, it's uh, a little bit black boxy, isn't it? It's, uh, uh, send money and a miracle will occur, and, and we don't quite know how the miracle is going to occur, but this is a picture of the Roman augurs slaughtering a chicken and looking at the entrails, and we kind of have the uh, 21st uh, century uh, uh, version of that. So, you know, we can either uh, have a black box answer. I was talking to Jim beforehand, and uh, uh, the, I've heard more times than you would care to know that uh, the science uh, decision makers go with their gut. I've heard that not only in the United States, I've heard it in the European Union, people who are responsible for distributing tens of billions of taxpayer dollars who are making decisions based on, well, seems like that's the right way to go. Seems, however, that uh, as Jack Marburger pointed out, that this was a little bit of the case of the emperor having no clothes, uh, and that we should be able to do better. In other words, if, uh, as I was saying to Jim beforehand, unless God is somehow speaking to those science decision makers and, and telling them what the answer is, those decisions must be being made on the basis of some data. So if those decisions are being made on the basis of some data, they're based on uh, a sense that when investments are made, the human beings who receive th that funding, the scientists, it's scientists who do science, uh, are behaving and uh, creating scientific advances in some kind of uh, describable fashion. 
The notion here is we've got uh, innovation and, uh, and science are fundamentally uh, social activities. So what we would like to be able to do is to build a science of science policy. So like any science, develop usable understanding and theories. You want to build measurement. And you want to get smart people to think about the, these problems. In other words, getting a bunch of federal bureaucrats to sit around a table and figure out what the answers are is probably not the right way of going about it. You want to build a community of practice, which includes the, the federal community, but also includes the research community, the research administrators, uh, quite broadly defined. And it turns out that there's a lot of people who've been thinking about these uh, issues for, for quite a long time, so engage them in the challenge. So uh, very much spurred by Jack's, uh, and full disclosure, Jack's a co-author. He's dead now, but uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for him. Uh, but very much spurred by Jack's vision, uh, the uh, White House set up a science of science policy interagency task group under the National uh, Technology Science Council. And that did a, there were 19 agencies that participated in that exercise. They looked at the way in which decisions were being made across federal agencies, did a literature uh, review as well as a questionnaire that was sent out. And uh, it, that roadmap, you might want to go and take a look at it. It was published in 2008. The other thing that came out of uh, Jack's comments, uh, which were at the AAAS in 2005, and uh, after that with the establishment of the program that I run at NSF, which is the SISIP program, the Science of Science and Innovation Policy. Uh, and so what that is uh, set up to do is to bring in the uh, social and domain scientists, behavioral social and domain scientists, to be able to say, how do investments in science work their way through the uh, um, society and through the economy? And then a common attempt uh, to build a data infrastructure called star metrics. So what were the roadmap findings? So in response to DOD's request, uh, across the board, there is not a very strong empirical infrastructure upon which to base decisions. Uh, across the board, in all the science agencies, and it's, let me emphasize, it doesn't appear just to be in the United States. It appears to be in, in many other countries as well. Uh, what we typically have is an infrastructure that is uh, focused on uh, identifying and supporting the best science, not necessarily building a management information system that helps you understand what science is being done. So in, in some sense, again, I'm an economist, in some sense, this is very similar to the way in which manufacturing was done in the 50s in the United States. You had Taylor coming in and looking to see how the auto industry was operating. And it was done seat of the pants by the gut. And Taylor came in and said, look, guys, you can think better about how you're producing automobiles. And GM said, nah, go away. We're doing just fine with our gut. Taylor went over to Japan instituted modern approaches to thinking about the process of producing cars and uh, made a big difference to the Japanese auto industry. And indeed, in the 80s, the Americans started to copy the Japanese because it made such a difference in the way in which their investments in the auto industry were being made. So it's very similar thought process here, uh, that we're now in a, in a globalized area where research is much more complex, team science, not individual science. Uh, seat of the pants is probably not the way in which you can do things. And what we need to do is to think about how to build data systems that enable us to make more scientific uh, approaches to an, our investment. So just a quick run through. Uh, when you take a look at what's being done at the agencies, and my agency's no different, we don't have systematic documentation of the inputs. We don't know who is supported by science funding. We can't provide you with information about the graduate students, the undergraduate students, the postdocs, who are integral to the production of scientific knowledge. Uh, and we know that. That came, became 
blindingly clear with the stimulus funding. Uh, we don't have a systematic link between inputs broadly defined, including infrastructure investments and outputs. In, we're in the 21st century, and we still expect principal investigators to do manual reporting, despite the fact that almost all scientific and economic uh, activity occurs electronically. Uh, we are very focused on bean counting in the sense of looking at the activities during the period of the award, which is, or, or a project, uh, which is four, three, four, five years. And yet we know that many of the results occur 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And capturing that uh, in an automated way would be ideal. Uh, we have very balkanized agency systems. So each agency has their own system. NIH doesn't know what NSF funds, which doesn't know what USDA funds, which doesn't know what EPA funds. So there's tremendous duplication that uh, can potentially occur. So one of the uh, uh, conclusions of the roadmap, and this is an official report, is the data infrastructure is inadequate for decision making. So back to the DOD questions. Uh, well, the data infrastructure was inadequate for decision making, but I think the call to arms that was instituted by this science of science policy and to some extent by the pressure that we're seeing from the, uh, from the taxpayer and from a, a request from the brass, the, your, your general, for example, which is say, they come in and they say, so what's, how do I make decisions? How, what data can I, can I use to base decisions on? And so what we're trying to do as a community, so I don't want you to think this is me up here talking. What I'm really doing is channeling in many ways the research community and the federal science agency community. What we're trying to do is figure out a collaborative way to respond to that challenge. Because if we don't do it, it's going to get done to us. Right? So we, one of the things we learned from the stimulus is that if we don't take a proactive approach to trying to respond to the answer of if we spend money in science, how is that going to work through the system, then OMB is going to say we're going to use a jobs metric or other types of metrics that may not be optimal for describing science. So what can we learn from the CISIP program? Um, so there have been five rounds of awards. Uh, these are both multidisciplinary and, and interdisciplinary. So it's across the board when you take a look at the, the dis disciplines that we're funding. Uh, science is complex. You need sociologists. You need um, ethnographers. You need anthropologists and psychologists to help you understand the complexity of science. That's the point of having qualitative case studies. But you also need quantitative and statistical methods. So we funded a lot of those. Um, one of the areas in which this field is very weak is the data infrastructure. So we've gone to the community and, and they've uh, developed the, the data systems or started to develop data systems that will help understand that. One of the other things that uh, CISIP has invested in, and um, you're looking at about close to $70 million of investments at this point uh, over time when you count in the um, co-funding from other institutions. Uh, one of the other things that we've leveraged is the fact that the advances in computational um, linguistics and in working with very large scale data sets, very heterogeneous data sets, mean that you don't need to just rely on survey and administrative type data sets. There are new ways of capturing that massive amount of information which is the way in which scientists communicate with each other, which is fundamental to understanding um, what the, the science of science policy is about. So uh, what we're really interested in here is the creation, transmission, and adoption of knowledge. Right? And so how that's being done, you can rely a lot on com computational approaches. So um, turns out the Japanese have been inspired by this. They have instituted their own Japanese CISIP program, uh, which is 100 million yen a year. Uh, and what they've done is they've followed very similar approach, which is funding researchers, 
funding a data infrastructure, but also the thing that they've done that's different from us is funding graduate student training to get graduate students up to speed in, in, in how to use these approaches. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, follow-on with the European and the Brazilians. So, so let me show you a little bit about what has been invested in in the SISA program. And I'm going to go live here. Um, this is, later on, I'm going to um, show you how this was developed. But you can go into uh, a site that is being developed using these new computational approaches. And I'm actually going to just type in my program element code so that we can see what research has been funded. So what we've done is we built this live. You've never been able to look at this before uh, using uh, natural language processing of SISIP proposals. And you can see that we've got uh, 36 um, uh, proposals with about 12 million being spent in innovation, industry, this is work being done with the Census Bureau, science and technology, public policy, creativity, kind of runs the gamut of what can be done. I'm sorry, now how, how are you get... You're not, no, no, this is a development site. You're not meant to look at, I don't want you to be looking at this site. This is the uh, site that I'm going to point you to. I'll, t I'll send it to you at the end. It's at NITRD. It's at NITRD, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is with support with George Strawn. Okay. But I'm going to show you the development site for right now because there are some pretty graphs that I want to show you. So let's show you what's going on in innovation. Uh, and so what you can see here is what divisions they're being funded in, how we've funded that over time. And I'm going to show you the researchers that we've supported. Okay. So you can see by geography, you can get some sense of the abstracts in which the research is being done. You can see a lot of the work's been done on linking uh, information by researchers and, and their work. And here's the information on the awards that have been uh, produced. So Later on, I'll give you the link where you can go in and take a look at the particular research areas uh, so you've got a sense of what investments have been made. Okay? Um, so going back to the... We've funded a lot of research. Uh, this gives you some uh, sense of what, that, what those investments have been in. Uh, the, the T number, is that a, some kind of a code out of a standard book someplace? Or? That's a great question. I'm going to ask you to hold off for just a second on what that T means, um, because what I'm going to tell you is how that site was generated from a system that was just set up to um, uh, describe, to, from the proposals that were sent in, and how we turned it into a management information system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm showing you here the focus is on SISIP and what we've invested in using the site. And then I'm going to show you how the star metric system enabled us to build this from administrative records. Uh, so all of this, this, these pieces of information uh, enable us to understand science investments. Okay, so one of the grants that we made, and this is heading right towards your question, one of the grants that we made was saying, how can we capture massive amounts of information about uh, the, what researchers are proposing to science agencies? So remember I said to you at the very beginning, we have 17 science agencies, and we couldn't describe what investments were being made in each agency. So how do you go about addressing that? Well, you could go and manually ask researchers to fill out keywords. What's the problem with that? It's sporadic at best. It's sporadic at best. And inconsistent. And inconsistent. You know, what you call cancer, I might call Krebs disease. 
So it's inconsistent, and, peop and people who have to do it won't do a very good job, right? So turns out, remember I told you about the computational approaches that have been developed? In the private sector, when people want to describe the uh, documents that are being put up on the web, does anyone require the people who post it on the web to develop keywords? No, what they do is they use computational linguistics, they use natural language processing to pull out the key ideas. Not key words, but key ideas. So one approach that we funded that turned out to be extremely successful is an approach called topic modeling. And this is Dave Newman from uh, University of California, Irvine. And what we did is we put 10 teams together. And we told them to, to mine, text mine, all the proposals in the NSF database. So this is an approach that it doesn't matter whether it's NSF data or EPA or U USDA or any agency data. The same approach can be used regardless of the agency. Yeah? Clarification, when you say all proposals, you mean all funding proposals? Uh, no, all proposals, declined and awarded. So we gave them um, clearance to come on site or virtually on site through the clearance process in a secure environment called the Nort Data Enclave. Uh, and they could do the analysis on all the data. And when I mean what I say data, it's all the text. And they're now doing exactly the same thing for USDA and EPA and the other agencies that are participating in star metrics. What this enables you to do is to develop the topic. So um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your uh, Lynn. Lynn. You heard Lynn say, what did that T mean? Well, what that T meant is these were topics that were generated from the text of the proposals that researchers wrote. Yep. Are, they're all. The, the proposals have intellectual property embedded in them. So um, they're protected by the Privacy Act. So everyone who accessed the confidential microdata had to uh, agree to the legal requirements. No, they were contractors. They, they weren't researchers. We turned them into contractors. So, so let me walk you through this. Um, Steve Pearson's up the back. Uh, I'm, he's at the American Statistical Association. I'm chair of the ASA Privacy and Confidentiality Subcommittee. So um, I spent a lot of time worrying about the privacy and confidentiality issues associated with this. So let me show you what comes out of this. So let's go into... Um, a but, but was topic modeling a generally uh, uh, discipline? I mean, is, is that yes. some... Is it so this is a well-known and robust field. So this is developed uh, in the mid-1990s. And so this is a, a reasonably robust approach. Now, bear with me for a second while I just walk you through. So you, you might be interested, for example, in engineering rather than my own program. So let's take a look, for example, at what comes out of the engineering directorate. So these topics that are generated, and I'm going to go to the, um, what you can see is they are aggregated enough that no individual proposal gets re-identified. And what is generated is in essence, bags of words. So here you've got seismology, seismic, earthquake, any structure, frame damage. So you've got the general topic. We're on an external site right now. So all you can see externally is the awarded proposals. If you're inside NSF and you are authorized to look at declined proposals, you can see the declined proposals. But externally, all you can see is the um, or bear with me, is the uh, awarded and publicly available information. So when I click on this, uh, you can see, for example, 
in this particular area in seismology. You can first of all see who's funded this research area. It's uh, CMI, which is one of our divisions, uh, the international division, and you can see that there are other topic areas that are associated with that seismology. Reinforced concrete, dynamics, vibration, soil dynamics. You can see each one of those topics is preceded by a T to tell you that it's a topic area. A program is preceded by a P. So um, what that enables you to do is then go in and I'm going to click on this seismology. Is that clicking up? It's hard. There we go. There we go. So I can now go in and take a look at the researchers, or I can look at the awards and zero in on the particular awarded proposals. Does that answer your question? So there's not enough information there to provide sensitive microdata, right? It's just telling you the topic area, and all that you're <coughs> seeing is the public information. I mean, yes and no. We've, we've recently been looking at the issue of you know, how do you manage science and technology in this exploding global environment where most of the work is done ultimately countries other than the United States. One of the things we proposed was getting around around all the published, all the proposed work to the government, from all agencies, funded and unfunded. Right. And the objective was to actually be able to tunnel down very deeply into these proposals, not just seismology, but what particular wrinkle is developing here that might be important. That's a great point. So what we did here is this enables you to find the general research area, right? And so now what you're able to do, I can't, this is hopeless, I can't see and, and look at the same time. Um, so what you're able to do here is describe by generic topic areas. And if you want to go into the, the whole expertise locator, you can find both the researchers and the proposals that are being done on an agency by agency basis. And then you can drill down to the individual level proposals. So if I were inside the agency, I could see the full proposal. Since I'm outside the agency, I could just look at the abstract. The agency controls how much access there is to the data. So but the uh, filter that puts it in there, the text mine used the whole proposal. The text mining used the entire proposal. So it seems that the granularity of the topics, uh, how is that decided? Am I correct in seeing a T581 or something? That yeah. seems like an awful lot of topics. That's a great question again. So you can see how important it is to be able to um, set the level of granularity. So when you're looking just at NSF, we had 200,000 proposals. So you were able to set a level of granularity of 1,000. Does that make sense? Uh, when, sure. If you, you're driven by the size of the sample, <coughs> as we add more agencies, you'll be able to get more granular or less granular. You can set the topic structure to be as granular or as coarse as you want. Right? But I don't want to spend too much time on this. Oh, well, one of the reasons Go I was ahead. asking is because eventually you're going to need to get into interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, areas. Uh, so you're not double counting if, if somebody's in two different ones? That's a great question. I think these are all really important questions. So you're getting right at the heart of it. So um, for example, ah, I don't know if this is going to come up, what you can see here is what was the dominant topic in that proposal. That's what I selected on. So now we, and the reason I wanted to show you that was the general portfolio. But each proposal has multiple topics. So it might be seismology in China. Uh, you looking at the human aspect. So you could see that there were three topics. 
So what you're able to do from this is actually, from a technical point of view, get at multiple topics at the same time. And we can select either on the dominant topic or on multiple topics. So it's a very rich approach. You can use it to describe any set of documents. So you can just have it describe proposals, projects, and also uh, the results and the outputs of the investments. So I'm not going to spend, we can spend more time looking at this later on. But the, the point here was automated capturing of what science is being done. And it only takes 10 data elements to capture this, including just the project description. How do you automatically capture information on the product? Well, publications, we, people have already seen how to do that. Uh, the patent database has been developed using, again, CISIP funding. And I'm, you're going to see how that is uh, used in just a minute as well. So actually, let me show you how that works. For the patent database, rather than relying on PIs to manually do the reporting, you can capture the information automatically. So if I'm interested in what has been generated, for example, by the chemistry division, by PIs who've been supported by the chemistry division, I can automatically pull that in from the patent database. And that's go this is going out and pulling in real time information on the patents that have been granted to researchers who were funded by the chemistry division. And it goes through and it automatically pulls that information off. And it's going to show it to you. Uh, if you click on this, uh, it actually goes and links into the patent data office. So the linking variable here is part of the person. You got it. So I'm going to, so the disambiguation of the patent database, which is an administrative database, and tying it to the individual was critical. Let me go through, um, what am I doing on time? I'm not doing well. I wanted to show you uh, some of the conceptual frameworks that were developed by the research community. So I've shown you a computational approach, which is the topic modeling. I've shown you a data system, which was the patent database. I wanted to show you some of the technical approaches that were developed in terms of the statistical and econometric analyses that could be used to tease out emerging fields and emerging ideas. Uh, many of these, by the way, are related to the work that's being done with the FUSE program over in IARPA. Uh, but I'm not going to have time to talk about those. Uh, you've got the handouts, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about them. Uh, you can ask me questions later. Uh, but the, the examples that I have here are very specific on the technical approaches that were being used. So this is how we tied in the CISIP research community in terms of the analytical structure uh, and I'm not, again, I, and identifying impact from a variety of different approaches. Um, what I want to focus in on for my last little piece of information is building the star metric system. And so what this was trying to do was to say, how can we use both the work that each agency has been doing and the work that the uh, scientific community has been doing to build uh, a better interagency system. So how do you set that together? So it's six federal agencies, US, led by the White House. So it's EPA, USDA, NSF, NIH, um, DOE. Oh dear. Nothing can be done, huh? I don't know. The basic idea is to build a better empirical basis for science policy, building an open and automated data infrastructure. We want to start off by documenting the federal investments in science. That was your question. And then start to build a system that links inputs, outputs, and outcomes. 
So going back to uh, your comment, what's the organizational framework within which we're operating? So as I started off by saying, science is done by scientists. The proposals aren't, don't do anything. And the grants don't do anything in their own right. You can't, the outputs are generated by human beings and clusters of human beings. So this is the core unit of analysis. The grants are the interventions. Okay? So, and then the products that they produce are the results of the people's and the team's behavior being changed as a result of those interventions. Of course, the institutions and the infrastructure matter as well. So the first thing to do is to try and describe in a systematic way what money was spent and where it was spent. And that was the portfolio explorer that I started to show you. The second piece is to describe who received the science funding. And as I said, not just the senior personnel, but the uh, graduate students, the undergraduate students, and so on. And not within the lens of a single funding agency, but the lens of all sources of funding. And that's a, a, a non-trivial challenge, it turns out, since we have RPI sitting here. It turns out that that information, at least for the extramural community, sits in the research institutions. So for example, when I was a faculty member, I got about $20, $25 million in research grants from a variety of different places, NSF, NIH, uh, Census, uh, Labor, um, Sloan, Rockefeller, SAGE, all of those funded my research uh, activities. But there is no way that an individual research in an individual agency could capture that information because of the balkanized nature of the research investments. So a very important part is just finding out who's doing the science. And then the last piece is starting to capture the products of the investments, the, um, the patent database was one example of that. But there's lots of uh, web of science and, and, and other types of databases that link back to individuals. I want to be clear here, those are not just economic products. Those are scientific, social, as well as economic and workforce products. So down here, we've kind of got a starting of a list. The important point to make here is not that we're thinking about a, a narrow timeline. What you, if you rely on manual reporting, you're never, ever going to capture that long timeline of 15, 20 years out. And if you rely on the people managing the projects to remember the way in which things work through, you're going to severely undercount and downwardly bias the way in which things work because people aren't going, the same people aren't going to be working in the field 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So your point's a very important one, and it, what it means is that it's super important to have electronic and automated ways of capturing this information that are built for the future, not just for the very, very short time horizon. Right? I mean, if you think about the concern that the science agencies had with the error reporting, the error reporting was saying, how many jobs were created this quarter? Right? That was the focus. And if, if that's the metric by which we're being measured, then that's going to severely underplay the importance of science. You need to build a system that can capture it over the long haul. And many of these things, patents, for example, the mean time for a patent is five years to be granted. And that's five years from when the application took place. So when you fund a research project, it'll typically take three, four, five years before you're even at something that can be applied through to the patent office. It might be 10 years. And then five years after that is a very long time. And that's the meantime, not obviously the, um, the tie-ins. Yep. Making a distinction between what DOD would term 6162, 6364, 
uh, between basic and applied? Basic yeah. Um, so they're all part of a continuum, right? So it's just where do you start? For basic research, obviously, um, the ability to capture these things is much more complex and richer in many ways than when you're further along the D spectrum. But that doesn't mean that one should... It, so again, uh, pardon me for my frame, I'm an economist, right? And so as Bronwyn Hall will point out, you should expect return, private return on investment to basic research to be low, right? If it were high, it should be being done by the private sector. The whole reason for the federal government to invest in basic research is that the social returns are way higher than the private returns. But, uh, or that the, that the discount rate, you know, if it's 20 years down the line, the discount rate's uh, going to obviate uh, any, any significantly high returns. So that's why it's very important for the federal government to understand that you're not talking about high rates of private <coughs> return on basic research investment. And so we need to be able to get that point across. Uh, just one more quick point. That means that failure also has significant value because you can tell the private sector that you failed and then they're not drilling dry holes. My point was going to be somewhat along the last line, which is a danger. You're creating a massive get into basic research and most of what's done in there will never show up in a, in a product anywhere. It's just the nature of that work because these are the things that come out of it. But you start really judging it by, well, let's take a 20 year look at a particular area. You do this, you're going to find a lot of it just never goes anywhere. If you knew how to sort that out at the beginning, you wouldn't have invested in that in the first place. Well, you know. So you've got to be careful you don't create a measurable quantity here that starts to deny your ability to invest in basic research. Well, Mark Largent actually has just written a, a very nice paper for Research Policy Review in which he makes the argument, and I think this is precisely right, that as a... Um, community, we have put too much emphasis on results and not enough emphasis on the value of failure. So when I talk about products, what we mean by that is scientific, social, workforce, and economic products. And part of the social product is the value of failure. I like to see you spell that in Capitol Hill. <laughs> 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 it's probably more difficult to spell it within the department. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me point out, I'm going to push back at you on the use, your use of the pronoun. Sorry. I'm going to push back at you on your use of the pronoun. It's not me, it's us. Right? This isn't my, this is a joint problem and this is a, a joint issue. Yeah. <laughs> Royal terms? Yes, I think the 1812 war was fought here, wasn't it? <laughs> I read that there were some uh, military activities here. Starometrics, see, you, you've actually written up there to document the outcome. Now, you've created the databases you've mentioned. And uh, no, it's not a database. I'd well, prefer to you think of it as a data platform. A data platform, which, can, which is flexible and can be, it seems to me, if your figures of merit involved, you've written four down, but somebody could recast those but, and use the same platform to, to engineer the kind of outcomes that they want to measure. Right, so, so, so let, me, let me again, I, and I, I hate to come at this from an economist background, but those are the blinders. So you can monetize the value of failure, right? The social value of failure. So if, for example, the government spends $100 million to find out that X doesn't work, and publicizes that, then, and four companies are saved spending $100 million each 
from not going ahead and doing that. So monetizing that's a possibility, right? Beg your pardon? No, they they were they would so the argument that you make is rather than each company which is protecting its intellectual property is not uh, going ahead and drilling in that dry scientific well and spending a hundred million dollars each by the basic research providing the information about that being a dry well there is a gain to society that's what you mean by social returns and as distinct from private returns anyway let me keep going because I've got I've got uh, 10 more minutes right so I've got a fair bit to go through so how do you document who's part of the scientific workforce so right now without getting principal investigators to write down who the graduate students, that undergraduate students and so on are. Because right now, every principal investigator sends in a report pretty much manually to every uh, source of their funding. So how do you develop an information system that can provide that information across agencies without PIs having to do that manually? But it turns out that those data exist within the financial systems of research institutions. <coughs> so anytime anyone in the external community, and we can talk about the intramural project system as well, it turns out that within the intramural system, uh, this is increasingly able to be tracked. Uh, people who are supported by an NSF grant or an NIH grant or a USDA grant if they're paid through that grant, it gets automatically captured through the HR system. So from that information, collaborating with the research institutions, and RPI is going to be one of them, but there are 85 of them right now, what NSF is able to do is for at least 45% of its portfolio, we've grown from uh, seven institutions to 85 in the past 15 months, uh, we're NSF is able to say how many FTEs there are, how many individuals, 24,000 individuals, as on, on the grants that have, have been provided, and then how many vendors and subcontractors are supported. So this is four individuals working a quarter year as one FTE? Is that yeah, you got it. So the important thing to note here is that ARA reporting insisted that we do FTEs. But the nature of the scientific workforce is People work part-time, the graduate students, the undergraduate students, and so on. So you want to capture that there are many more people being uh, supported by science funding than is simply captured by the FTEs. That the nature of the scientific workforce is fundamentally different. And to get across a couple of things to our friends on the Hill, that this is um, training the sons and daughters of the great state of New York uh, as well as uh, supporting them uh, uh, currently. You're able to document that the funding, there's this notion that science, and we, we've heard this on the Hill over and over again, that science funding goes to support welfare queens in white lab coats, <laughs> which hurts everyone's feelings, right? But in fact, using the HR records, so these are financial transactions, you can actually show that faculty are the, uh, the, uh, a minority of the occupations that are supported. Uh, and by the way, going back to your question, you can show how many individuals there are per FTE. So um, there's lots of richness that can be got out of that information without having a single PI lift a pen. And because there are only 14 data elements that are required out of the HR and financial systems, most institutions can set up a script that pulls those elements in about 30 to 40 hours the first time, and after that, it's automated. It's just at the push of a button. So it's like the LEHD program. It's exactly like generating UI wage records. So the design is exactly the UI LEHD program. And then you've got the microdata, and then with the permission of the 
uh, recipient institutions, what Michigan is doing, for example, is they're linking those data on the faculty, the graduate students, the students, to the, to the census data, which enables you to identify the startups that are uh, created by the people who receive the awards, where the students get jobs, the industries, the firms, the productivity and the growth patterns of those firms. And that can be automatically done, again, without any uh, surveys or uh, any burden on the PIs. Okay, so you can immediately document the regional economic development impact of uh, the research funding because you can tie what research is being done. Remember the original picture? You can show what the students were working on, show where they got jobs, where the faculty started up positions, or the consulting that the faculty did through their 1099s and schedules, sees their non-employer databases. All of that creates the data infrastructure. So it's not a database, it's a data infrastructure that then enables you to capture that information. And we've got Scott here who's actually been working on some of that micro data as well. Um, so, uh, and I'm running out of time, I've only got one minute left. I already showed you how you can generate information about uh, the portfolio that you've invested in. Uh, NSF, for example, with a $7 billion uh, investment portfolio has been relying on its programs, program element codes to describe the investments that are being made. So for example, chemistry. But it turns out a lot more chemistry is being funded than simply by the chemistry division. And a lot more chemistry is being done than by researchers in chemistry departments. So by using the topic modeling, what you're able to do is to find out exactly where that's occurring. So uh, that's the picture of that topic modeling again. So what that enables you to do is to characterize your portfolio on a science, uh, using the science that the researchers themselves used. So I'm not going to, I'll show you the link live later, but essentially you can do a directorate level view from NSF, and you can show uh, if I'm interested in a particular area within my directorate, so I'm choosing bio in honor of Mark who's sitting here, I can show you uh, within my directorate, here's the area of research and species. I can show the funding by division, by topic. I can show the co-occurring topic <coughs> areas uh, that in which work is being done. I can drill down and find out which awards and which researchers uh, have been doing work in this area. This is public information. I'm on the external part of the website. Inside, I can see a lot more detail, and I can click on to the full text proposal rather than the abstract. If I were a VP for research, if this were built internally facing, I could see all the research that was being funded by this researcher. So if you were looking at me, you'd be seeing my NIH, my NSF, my all the different sources of my funding in the project. You can see the uh, geographic lens. So these are different lenses from which I can look at the internal data infrastructure within NSF. Non-trivial exercise took nine months of really, really smart people pulling the data together from different sources. But this is what was able to be generated. Um, and then I can see which institutions. So when someone on the Hill uh, or our Office of Legislative and Public Affairs says, what have you funded in state X in area Y, you can pull it off automatically. You don't have to email around and ask human beings to try and remember what on earth it was that was being funded particular challenge at NSF where you have so many rotators and even uh, when you're dealing with people who leave after a few years with normal turnover. Uh, you can uh, then come in. I showed you drilling in from the bio directorate because I was interested in the bio portfolio, but suppose I'm interested in a cross agency and within the agency. Imagine also as we're building in the USDA and EPA data being able to do this thing so I could see what USDA and EPA were funding and the overlap. 
But here I can see uh, different parts of NSF are actually funding these areas. Of, this is species, this particular topic area, and how much they've invested. So it shows me collaborations. And uh, then from the agency, I can see which areas and identify researchers who are doing research in that area who I might not know. So it contributes to a democratization of research. And an un so it's not just the old boys network, which is uh, sadly what it uh, uh, turns into. Uh, this is the patent information. Very careful here. This is no statement of causality, it's a correlation. What patents have been granted to researcher, NSF researchers who had been funded by NSF grants in this directorate. Uh, the advantage of this is your manual reporting simply doesn't capture it. We capture way more this way than one would capture off manual reporting. And the advantage is it tells me the technology classes, it tells me the assignees, the firms, all of this automatically off the patent database. And so you can drill down into the details here and find those relationships. Ob obviously of interest to many of us, the advantage of these kinds of data is uh, they're focused on the individual and now you're able to start to build networks because you see their networks on publications, on patents, on proposals. And that is how science is done nowadays, right? It's not just your so sole scientist. It's much more complex than you're able to capture manually or even through your gut. Uh, you've got other views, what Congress likes to see, and what the public like to see is what science has been funded in what topic area, so that businesses can see where the expertise is located. So this is getting built out, and more detail obviously tied into research.gov. Two more slides and then I'll shut up. My husband never believes me when I say that either. He didn't. <laughs> uh, so what are the pitfalls? Well, you, you know as well as I do. Uh, the danger of showing patents is that's going to work for some areas, but not for others. Economists don't do patents. Does that mean we're useless and worthless? Don't answer that. Um, I saw you thinking it. <laughs> so, um, but we need to paint full picture. And this is exactly your point. Engaging the community to develop a full picture of scientific outcomes. We put four there, but the community, we, not me, need to be engaged in developing that data infrastructure. Real problem with data misuse, I don't need to tell you that. Any time you put data out, there can be problems. So we as a community need to be very careful how this is presented. Um, you've got to worry about data quality. That's why the collaboration with the researcher and the research community is critical, because they'll go through and validate if it's about them. They'll correct. If it's just them reporting, it disappears into the more, no one cares. Uh, Confidentiality, obviously this is a hobby horse of mine. Um, how do you protect intellectual property? How do you protect, particularly in the DOD context, but also in DOE, uh, even at NIH, right? There's primate research that might be, you know, the researcher might not be comfortable with that information being made available. How do you set up those sets of controls? This is a community uh, challenge. So where do we want to go? Um, I've spent my life working, uh, studying the effect of interventions in labor, uh, education, and health policy. It would be nice to have the quality of the discourse in science policy be as scientific as it is in those other fields. Um, so it would be nice to have this a fully-fledged academic field. Um, I'd like to see science policy in the same analytical tier as tax policy. So, for example, when CBO does projections of different sets of investments, now CBO, you know, they, they use the tools and the models that exist. They do reasonably good simulations of the results of changes in taxes. They've got a tax model they can work their way through. 
obviously with lots of errors, but at least they have a sense of the order of magnitude and the way in which things work their way through. When you look at different types of investments, labor, education, health, they can do scenarios. They have nothing like that. The science investments, despite the fact that we think that investing in science matters a lot and that it will continue to matter a lot for the competitiveness of this country. It would be nice if we were all singing from a, at least a similar hymn book where we're not every time OMB or Congress says, what's the answer? We come up with a thousand different methodologies and different responses. Uh, and when you're dealing with the state legislature, the same thing. And then develop a common scientific infrastructure for the research community because they're the ones that are going to be able to solve our problems uh, faster than uh, the federal bureaucracy can. So that's the end of the story. Thank you very much. So, I don't, you guys can or those that can. I'm sorry I went so long. Yeah. If you can afford another 10 minutes or so, or those that can have some questions. But I do want to ask a question about uh, what are the outcomes. You, you mentioned um, over 150 awards under SISIP and it's been ongoing for uh, several years. I'm kind of wondering what examples are of, 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 of effects on uh, policy making for science and technology, either investment or its content uh, or, or direction <coughs> that has come from this program or are there improvements that you can point to towards science and technology policy decisions that have been made? Well, we, we've seen a couple of them right now, the topic modeling and the patent data are being built into a decision-making system for the agencies, or at least being considered for being, being used. Um, so the first set of results, I guess, um, the first set of awards were, being, were made in late 2007. And so the first results are coming out now. Hi, I'm Bill Andrews. I'm on the faculty at the Industrial College here at NBU. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And how have you thought about uh, output results uh, that benefit the United States versus uh, more global impact? And you know, is there a sense that you know, or uh, uh, some kind of effort to try to measure? Okay, so what benefit do U.S. taxpayers get versus you know, free ride the rest of the world? Uh, you mean those damn foreigners? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a actually a great question again. Um, the one of the challenge with investing in science is, you know, very much that it's a global process. So it affect it. Everyone gains from those investments in science. There is. Uh, some work that has been done by people like Erica Fuchs and Dieter Ernst that suggests that um, when you make investment, and I'm sure that Scott has some good answers for that, when you make investments in a um, university, let's say, or in a, in a research institution, that because so much of uh, human activity is regionally bound, the way in which that knowledge is transmitted and adopted is more likely to be regional than global, right? So uh, the work that Lee Fleming has done, and I'm sorry, I don't know your research as well, Scott, but the work that Lee Fleming has done uh, certainly suggests that the way in which Silicon Valley, for example, uh, had such a big impact was the graduate students who came in and uh, the faculty who started up businesses and so on. So that that was regionally bound. Um, he's done a similar study. For, we did a study for Caltech, um, which was one of the first star metrics institutions. And so we looked at the Caltech faculty. And then we looked at the university, uh, where they located, and how that information was transmitted, and the firms in the local area. And a lot of that was the graduate students getting jobs. That was the number one effect. Um, so there is no question that it spread globally. But a lot of the impact is regional, and Scott may yeah, be able to. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, you know, transition to regions within a global network. 
and uh, uh, so yes, there'll be global spillover, but, uh, uh, but I think she's right that most of the <coughs> initial impact, at, at least anyway, is going to be regional uh, within the U.S. Because my poor mother-in-law sent my husband to University of Missouri and St. You know, she's from St. Louis and hoped he'd marry a nice St. Louis girl. And she got one out of three. I <laughs> um, just want to comment on the, the notion of duplicative research. I, I, over the years, felt that that's overplayed. And so one of the things that this tool will allow is I'll find out eventually whether I was right or not. I, I think there are local forces at the program manager, director level that mitigate that to a great degree. Oh. But it's also what the value of something like this might be. Um, that same level is the one that possesses the knowledge that, of who you are funded by. Right. Your, your program manager, when you said no one knew all the uh, different sources of your research, that's not exactly true. Your program managers all knew exactly who funded you. But that is not known in any global way because those folks roll over. They on, so and so we capture it. information, but not in any systematic way Absolutely of, of right. current Absolutely. and pending support. But the historic support or anything that comes on down the line, agree no one does. And we don't capture it systematically. But yeah, uh, up the back and then got more questions here. Um, I have actually two questions. Can you all introduce yourselves? Oh, sure. I'm Carrie Nelson. I'm with the GW Institute of Public Policy. Um, so my first question is, so a lot of the data that you get from the Is that exportable into like Excel or anything like yep. that? It is? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Um, Number one, that, so, so bear with me for a second. The big thing here, and I really want, I, I didn't emphasize it nearly enough. The big thing here is that was a pretty shiny toy, right? But the big thing here was building the data infrastructure that sucked in the information. And what we're building, or we hope to build, is an API, an application programming interface, so that people who have different sets of questions can put other shiny toys on. So an iPhone app, right? So it's basically we're, what we want to build is ways in which the community can make use of that data and, and add in and, and um, uh, develop it. So. Okay, great. And those are currently available, like exporting to Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering, is, is there a place potentially on the website, it would take too much time right now, but to get specifics on the metrics that you're actually using that go into what, what does economic impact mean? What does We're not, impact? so despite the name, it's a data platform, it's up to the community to figure out what metrics work okay. and what don't. Okay. So uh, you can, okay. Mm -hmm. Name and name, rank, and serial research. number. I'm Reed Scott. <laughs> I'm on detail from the Army Research Laboratory to the White House at OSTP. Okay. So I come around the DoD world where most of, if you're in the 6263 world, it's all PE, PE and projects. Is there any consideration of moving this towards looking at that available data that, you know, like today, on the Congress, or all the R2 uh, submissions from the services? So that's. Um, exactly where we're heading. I don't know if you heard. Um, so the, the de all, all the data elements that are needed are uh, start date, end date, senior personnel, program code that funded it, so, so some organizational structure information, obligated dollar amount. And then the key things that you want are the project description title and then some kind of text that describes what it is that you did. And uh, so a project description is perfectly fine. That's what uh, USDA has, for example, and it's what EPA has, and uh, many parts of DOE. So that basically gets fed into the people-eating machine, the, the document-eating machine. It's a Bayesian, I, one other thing is, it's a Bayesian algorithm, and so it gets trained on the documents, but it can also take human input as well. If, if, uh, and building that feedback loop is going to be an important part of the next steps. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't matter whether it's a proposal, it just needs to be text that describes the work that's being done. And that's what makes it so powerful. It doesn't matter whether it's intramural, extramural, contract research, as long as there is something 
that describes the work that's being done, it's a candidate for topic modeling. Yes? Uh, Matt, Rob Medvey from Austin Naval Research. Um, you mentioned that you'd like to see science policy on the same level as uh, St. Plain Field. Uh, science policy? In 20 years or so. Uh, I, uh, I was at Harvard uh, at an in Innovation for Economic Development course uh, headed up by Dr. Juma. Uh, really an international course. Callistus Juma? Yes. Yes. He, uh, or the class consists, consisted of mostly international uh, science and technology policy right. uh, individuals. It seems like other countries, do you, do you have an example country uh, that would be a model for using science policy uh, here in the United States? Uh, some of the South American countries. In Brazil. Have... Brazil has done a fabulous job. Um, you know, and I talk about it in my nature piece. By the way, in a pathetic attempt to increase my H index, please go and cite my nature piece on let's make science metrics more scientific. But um, that was a joke, Gus. Um, the, you know, it, when you have uh, authority to give a grade, people laugh at your jokes. But when you don't, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, so Brazil has developed this fantastic platform called the Lattes platform. I really recommend, so they built it understanding that science is done by scientists. So they built it off the CVs of scientists. And on that infrastructure, because that really describes what they're being done, who's being funded and so on, they built an innovation portal, uh, science portal, uh, that is being used by all the agencies and by businesses. So it's a phenomenal approach. Now they started building that in the uh, mid 90s. And so they've got a 15-year head start on us. But they're really um, re leading the way in many, in many respects. Uh, so I would hold those up for you, and I can send you some links to what they're, they're doing. Now, so it's, they they've, institu yep. they've institutionalized it, and they've developed things that uh, helps them with their competitive advantage. So when IBM wanted to know who's doing research in area X, they can immediately find out who are the researchers in the country who are doing research in area X. And they cite that example as one way and one reason why IBM located a particular set of plants there. And it's really helped with their science and technology policy strategy. And you've probably seen the Brazilians present at OSTP. I know that uh, we've been highlighting what their work's been doing. Um, the Japanese are, as I said, uh, we're using more modern technology than they are now because we're just starting and they with 1990s, late 1990s technology. The Japanese are building out a system. I'll be in Tokyo in a couple of weeks and uh, uh, learning from what they're up to. <coughs> Sorry, yeah. So uh, let me get him and then you, if that's okay. Yeah, this is probably a ways down the road, but the question then is, I mean, regional economic input, impact. Is there any way to track back from well-commercialized developments to the science that stimulated them? I mean, and, you know, I, I had dinner with uh, Charles Hirschfeld. We were talking about the ARPANET early work on AirNet, you know, and the Beyond Tang from the space program. That's like that. apocryphal. Tang was not related to the space program, well, it okay. turns out. But, uh, well, I mean, that's uh, the sort of thing where you can Or the GPS, the GPS out of, uh, right. yeah. Right. So, so, yes, in fact, my colleague Stefano Batuzzi at NIH did, has used these kinds of data because once you've got, remember your interest in the creation, transmission, and adoption of knowledge, once you have those human links, you can trace. So you could do trace studies that uh, instead of going uh, backward, go forward and see what, uh, how that initial investment, his examples with TNF-alpha, turn into you know billions of dollars in value added and he can show the network of scientists that did it because you can trace it through and that's exactly what people like Scott are doing and there's a lot of research funded in the CISIP program that looks at precisely that. Um, Scott's colleagues who are funded out of CISIP, uh, Ping Wang and Ben Schneiderman have been scraping the web to capture those interactions so you can do it both through transaction data and through uh, network data. Okay, Chris from the Washington Corps. I was wondering if you could uh, give a little preview of what we might expect in terms of uh, 
uh, enhancements to the uh, star metrics over the next year or so and additional functionality or data sets? Uh, well, it's a community decision. We just, um, we've been working with the Federal Demonstration Partnership with AAU and APLU. We have an o OSTP has set up an organizational ho operational home in NIH. And so that business plan is uh, being developed as we speak. So it would be great to have DOD participating because every agency that comes in helps shape it in different ways. And obviously, DOD is a non-trivial part of the R&D budget. So it would be great to have you guys participate. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Gene, I'm, I'm a fellow here at the Center for Technology and National Security Policy, but also uh, with the National Academy's Board for Army Science and Technology. What uh, interface are you having with the Academy? Uh, so we work primarily with SINSTAT, Committee on National Statistics, so Kay Husband's feeling Connie Citro. Um, Lee Fleming is on a nanotech board and they've got me coming and talking to the nanotech board and there was a guy who Bruce Barnow, uh, uh, sorry, um, Bert Barnow had me connect with on the uh, DOD scientific workforce but uh, he and I didn't really connect very quickly but, um, but we're happy to engage as much as you need us to. I guess from a, both a congressional perspective and a DOD perspective, I was formerly in the department and also on the Hill, uh, the, uh, to be able to tie then requirements, the requirements process, then directly into, okay, how are the sciences uh, being applied? And those are fundamental questions that the uh, department is trying to come to grips with right now is the, uh, uh, the decreasing resources and increasing pressure. Well, exactly. And it really, to go back to the auto analogy, it wasn't until there were economic pressures on the automobile industry that they turned attention to doing things better. And, you know, I know that people don't like to have budget cutbacks, but I worked a lot at the Census Bureau and within the statistical system, and there were a number of people there who said the best thing that happened to the statistical agencies was the cutbacks in the 80s because it meant that they were forced to do things smarter and better, and they restructured their operations. They weren't so fat and happy anymore. Yeah, the problem with the department is the acceptance of the tools to, uh, yeah. uh, to make those best sort of decisions. It's a human. It, it, at, at the end of the day, I'm a social scientist, because you can build any technology you want, but it's the human adoption that's critical. So what's critical is to build things that had value to all the stakeholders. That's what made the LEHD program a success. The critical thing here is to recognize it's us, right? It's we. So in critical to engage the, the scientific community, critical to engage the federal community, and it's critical to engage the stakeholders as well. Thank you very much. Glad you came. Those things are um, difficult to quantify in many areas and modes in the uh, basic research area. So you're you're an economist. I'm an astronomer. So how <laughs> how is that very esoteric? And so I wanted to point out this this issue which you were I think alluding to, which is there are secondary. So there's investment in astronomy, um, and uh, at NASA, for example, the investment is in the same aerospace companies that also do DOD projects. And uh, I, I know that widgets are created, technologies are created at those companies to do astronomy, and then they make their way out into other applications, which might fare better in some of these evaluations. So I think what's important is you engage the social scientists with the domain scientists. So the domain scientists have an understanding about how the domains play out. But I'd also very strongly argue that social scientists have sp spent their careers thinking about how to do assessment and evaluation.